So the next thing that was done was that was shrunk down, different implementations and ZFS is handled that a bit differently, but I think most people found that in fact more than about five uh, requests in that queue didn't really give you an awful lot of extra performance. So keeping that five meant your synchronous request could now you know, go through much faster, they're only queued behind five. But anyway, we've done what we should have done earlier on and actually broken this out now. So there's, I think, five queues, one for synchronous read, one for synchronous write, async read, async write, and the scrub resilver being the kind of background task. Uh, so that keep, kind of keeps the IOs separate, so you can fill up your asynchronous read, asynchronous write as much as you like, but these, the synchronous operations will still go through first. Um, good, better performance. But it's very much synchronous operations are kind of really critical. Yes? Would there be an option for expanding that for another queue for antivirus scanning? You know, for yet a lower level of priority. Um, I, I would guess so. Um, I didn't. I mean, fair amount, I didn't yeah. develop any of these myself, so it's difficult to answer just, that. Just thinking, my Windows machines quite often, you know, at the the laptop, I um, antivirus scanning hits the performance so badly, and it needs to be done, but it certainly doesn't need to be done. So is the virus the scanner level. actually running on the Windows system, accessing the file system? Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I guess one of the challenges there would be how does the how does ZFS know that it's that? If yeah. the virus scanner actually running on ZFS? Um, you know, directly on the host system, there may be some way of telling. But yeah, I mean, in principle, if you can work out how to you know, identify how, how to identify that, that, I would guess that's possible. Um, no, right, that was quite nice actually. Adam Leventhal did that. Um, they came up with the idea. I think he implemented it as well. If you actually look at what happens to a file system, and in particular scenarios, you find that actually an awful lot of the blocks being written back to files haven't changed. You know, a scenario may be an application like a, a you know, mail program reads in a giant mail folder, um, checks two or three bits to say, oh yes, you've read that now, and then writes the whole mail folder back. And of course, most of it never changed. Um, so there's a, an interesting uh, feature there where you just say, you know, if you're trying to write back a block that hasn't changed, then don't bother. At the moment, that is only enabled if you've got um, data compression on, but actually the kind of two are nothing really to do with each other, so there's been some discussion about splitting that apart. But you do need SHA-256. Oh yes, sorry, good point. Yes, you do need uh, SHA-256 because it, same reason deduplication, it, it uses the same technique of checking the, the checksum. Um, ZFS send progress reporting. Um, you get a better idea of, of how far a send has gone. Uh, this one's actually hit me in, in the older Open Solaris one, ZFS IO Deadman thread. So if you get a, a thread that's, that gets stuck at the back end doing an IO that for some reason is never going to complete, which is probably like a buggy drive or a buggy bit of hardware, um, that would not really, that didn't tend to, to flag up initially, except that after you've done a, a fair bit more IO, you tend to find that ZFS eventually deadlocked. But that could, well, with, with me just working at home on my server, that was like half an hour later before I realized that actually ZFS was not committing any more transaction groups, and I, nothing I'd done in the last half hour was going to get to disk. Um, this now spots that, and um, it's uh, different platforms do different things, so I think some of them, uh, if I remember correctly, I think Linux panics on it. I think Solaris. It almost does as well. Oh, it does it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think. Um, How about the, <laughs> There's a, I'm a bit confused here because I know that um, my own company also did that slightly differently, though that hasn't yet gone back into a loom or something. That actually feeds that into the FMA um, in infrastructure. But anyway, we'll, um, I think there's some merging going on there. So there's an interesting example. Um, L2 arc compression, you get much more benefit out of your L2 arc if it looks much bigger because you compressed it. Um, Metastat histograms is, a, is another interesting one. Most, this is to do with finding uh, optimal size blocks. In, so Metastat describes this kind of free space. Uh, if, when you're trying to load, um, when you're trying to write to ZFS, bear in mind ZFS only ever writes to free blocks, so you've got to find free space to write into. Um, what ZFS sort of traditionally did was kind of look for the biggest free blocks. Um, and use those because they're kind of easier to use. That could be quite hard, and it could be quite hard to find them. So what we now do is that um, each of the Metaslabs actually keeps a histogram 
of the different blocks, numbers of different block sizes it's got available. This means it's very quick to scan and see if that meta slab's got anything in it that's of interest to you. Um, that's kind, this is kind of you know just the, the sort of start of uh, a number of things that might actually you know, be based on that, that technology because it enables you to get better visibility of things like fragmentation of the, the meta block. Yes. Sir. Andrew, do you know the, the memory um, uh, footprint? Or, or cost for the histogram? No, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, because I, I remember one of the old uh, hacks used to be offload all your all your um, space maps into memory. Yes. I'd watch as it just gobbled gigs of RAM. <laughs> I okay. think this part of the idea of this is that you can kind of look at those without doing that. So you can you know, skip past the, the meta blocks. I haven't looked at it in detail, but I think so you can <coughs> skip past some of the meta slabs that are not suitable. Um, Always a good thing. Yes. <laughs> um, You're supposed to sort of avoid your having to load the meta slab at all. So you just skip over it if it if you know there's no benefit in that. You won't load it at all. So there's also um, some work going on. I'm not sure if it's there yet, but that will report up at the sort of per VDEV level how fragmented the meta slab is. Of course, we've actually got it at the meta slab level inside ZFS, but you know that. That's not a useful thing to have coming out of a command line for most people, but having it you know, reported at VDEV level possibly is. So, um, I won't go through the rest of those things just in the, for the sake of time. But, uh, so, work in progress. Uh, resumable send and receive is, is something that's um, in progress at the moment. Um, this. So send and receive is used for asynchronous um, replication in, in many scenarios. Uh, one of the issues is that uh, if the underlying transport is a little bit ropey or there's some other problem, that can break. And then you've got the, the issue of, well, I need to send it all again because as soon as the connection breaks, the moment the ZFS receive will destroy the data that it's uh, received and uh, you've got to start over again. So uh, the resumable send and receive is being uh, implemented. Um, there's another new feature, a little bit related to that, called bookmarks, and that's actually already there. That's, that's just recently gone back into the code base. So a bookmark is like a, um, a ghost of a, of a best description, it's kind of a ghost of a dead snapshot. So if you think when you're sending, doing a series of incremental sends, you, you create a snapshot, you, um, well, you'll have a pair of snapshots, an older one and a new one, you send the the data that is the difference between those, and that's your, your incremental send. You didn't actually need that old snapshot because you already sent that the last time. That data's already there, but the data kind of stays on disk so that you've got the marker for where to send from uh, in order to start the incremental. So what a bookmark does is you can kind of bookmark a snapshot and then get rid of the snapshot. So you can bookmark that old snapshot, then delete the snapshot, but you can still do your incremental send from the bookmark. So the bookmark kind of remembers where the, um, the original uh, snapshot was. So it enables you to free up data on the disk earlier. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but it may also be involved in some of the uh, ZFS sends and uh, ZFS receive remote replication, but I haven't seen the detail of how that works under the covers. So it's not that, it's not that yet. Um, some other things that are on, on, the, uh, on the go at the moment. Uh, persistent L2 arc, um, that's sort of been, uh, if you sort of follow the uh, mailing list, that's been being tested for some time now. Um, compressed arc storage tier. So at the moment we've got the arc, which is kind of in memory storage, and then we've got the L2 arc, which is you know, the, typically on, um, a, an overflow of that into an SSD. Okay, overflow, that's a bit simplistic, but you can think of it that way. This adds a, um, a third one, it's actually a middle one in between those two. So you take your arc and you still keep the, you know, the data you're accessing really quickly as is, but data that is not being accessed quite so frequently and is probably you know, a candidate to be rolled out to the other arc and go through another stage in between where you compress it so you get more into your arc. Performance fragmented pools, I kind of hinted at this before, but it's building a lot more on top of the um, new Metaslab histograms. Um, another thing that's really quite interesting is integrating that with the right throttle. Um, 
So if you're trying to slow down a writer for some particular reason, and, and one of them is actually the Samayo resource management um, coming along as well. At the moment, if you think about it, we, we sort of allocate data out of the meta slabs to go as fast as possible. But on the other hand, if you're trying to slow somebody down, well, why are you allocating data out of the meta slab so you can write as fast as possible? So this kind of turns that around. So say if we're actually trying to slow a writer down, then rather than going for these big blocks out of the meta slabs, mm -hmm. let's go for some of the really small, expensive ones with a pain in the backside. Because the well, you might as well actually say, well, look, you know, we want to slow down. Let's not use our big blocks that we can save for when we want to write a full pair. Let's go and use some of the little, little fragmented blocks. Otherwise, we just get lost. So that's kind of an idea behind that. Um, there's some more um, D-Trace provider. Um, uh, some more visibility inside D-Trace provider for ZFS. Uh, device removal is very nice design for that. So you probably all, or, or a number of you will have heard of the infamous block pointer rewrite. That it's never going to happen just because uh, it was far too complicated. It doesn't fit the layering of ZFS. But uh, George Wilson and Matt Adams, <coughs> so probably about six months or so ago, come up with a very nice scheme for doing device removal that doesn't involve that. Um, when you come with design, it's nice and simple, as opposed to block pointer rewrite that was about as complex as you could go. But one of Matt's comments about block pointer rewrite was, <coughs> it was probably the last feature for ZFS, because once it was there, he didn't think anyone would be able to do any more code changes to the code base. <laughs> um, so that's, that's something that people have been after for a while. Um, per VDEV properties. So, You've got properties across a whole pool, but you might actually want different properties across uh, VDEVs in a pool. For example, if you've got different types of disk in a VDEV. Um, now, one example might be you've got a pool that was all created with uh, 512 byte per sector disks, but you want to add another VDEV to it that's all 4K sector, or you want to do, so you, know, you can have different A shift per VDEV. Now, there are at the moment some implementations of um, uh, specifying the A-shift, I think, in both BSD and Linux. And there have been various hacks for doing it in Illumos as well um, to override particularly disks that claim to be 512 bytes per second when they're really fast. <laughs> um, but this is kind of, you know, one of the future possibilities for this is actually to kind of do that properly so you can actually set the, the, uh, the A-shift factor per VDEV. Uh, metadata storage tier, that's another um, kind of use for the uh, the per VDEV properties. So we can actually define perhaps VDEVs that just hold metadata. And that's one of the things that Next Center is doing at the moment. And again, you might put those on different disks, but typically you might choose to put those on SSDs to have a, a, a metadata, um, you know, SSD cache for the metadata running much faster. Um, looking at uh, one megabyte and actually also looking at four megabyte block support. Um, one of the issues in there is whilst that's not particularly difficult in Solaris, it's extremely difficult in most of the other kernels that uh, ZFS runs on. Um, Linux is having problems actually even handling 128k blocks. Um, it just doesn't have the kernel infrastructure for doing that. Solaris is pretty unique in that respect. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, it's worth mentioning. Multi-modifier protection, that's for when you're building uh, ZFS into a clustered system and you don't want two heads to be modifying it at the same, modifying file systems at the same time. Um, it's not, I hate to add, turning ZFS into a clustered file system, it's just providing built-in protection against doing it when you didn't mean to. Um, channel program, doesn't mean a selling <laughs> it's, it's a means for passing down a series of commands into ZFS that are all um, executed in the same transaction group. So there's a little bit of this now. If you do something like ZFS snapshot minus R, it, it actually feeds down a whole load of snapshots that all go into the same transaction group, but it's kind of hacky the way it works. Part of the idea of this is actually to build inside ZFS a kind of little bytecode interpreter, you know, like a sort of Berkeley packet filter type thing, and you feed down sets of things that you decide, you know, it's quite limited what you can do at the moment, is you can do a few snapshots, but um, and it's not perfect at the moment. It kind of looks at the file system, comes back into user space, does some munching around, then sends the snapshots down in one go. Um, well, you might have created another few file systems in that gap, so it, you know, it wouldn't necessarily catch those. This would prevent that by having all of that being done atomically inside the kernel. Um, 
preferred plaques, that's the ability.